would be a little uh, forbidding to, to give, uh, um, uh, forbidding and an honor to be giving the hour lecture on any occasion. Um, giving it in this time and place uh, is quite something, uh, quite an honor. The, the, um, we've heard a lot about how uh, uh, well known and influential the Jerusalem Summer School has been with Arrow. Um, we are all uh, students of Kenneth Arrow and it's been, um, it was an, a wonderful event um, hearing all these permanent reminiscences. So thank you very much for inviting me, it's a great honor. <coughs> all right, so I was gonna talk about mechanism design and complete information. Uh, and now let's just start working. It's not good. <coughs> All right, that works, through my hand. Okay, so um, mechanism design. Here's the, so this is the rubric that was just used for the summer school. It's actually rather important what this says for my talk. Uh, mechanism design is the reverse engineering part of economic theory. Normally economics study existing economic institutions and try to predict and explain what outcomes the institutions generate. Mechanism design is the other way around. We start with the outcomes we want and then ask for the institutions that could be designed to achieve those outcomes. I'm going to talk about incomplete information. When I talk about incomplete information, it's going to be rather important for me that we're going the other direction, and we'll see why. Okay, so here's a distinction, uh, different types of assumptions about information that we sometimes make in economics, uh, which also is going to be important for me. So we sometimes make a distinction between um, perfect information, so a situation where everything is common knowledge among the players, a situation of complete but imperfect information. So there may not be perfect information, not everybody knows everything. Uh, there's not common knowledge of, um, there are things that people don't know because there's some uncertainty or there may be asymmetric information. Some people know things that, that other people don't know, but at least complete but imperfect information is supposed to capture the idea um, that there's common knowledge of the structure of the environment, the, the situation that we're in. Okay, and one can contrast that with what has been called incomplete information, an, an idea uh, that's out there. I'll talk a little bit about the history. The idea about incomplete information is that you really don't have some basic structure of the world that's common knowledge. Um, uh, so, so you really can't make uh, any assumptions about there being common knowledge of anything that's going on. That's the original idea of people who've talked about uh, incomplete information. Okay, so von, Mo von Neumann and Morgenstern in 1944 wrote a book called The Theory of Games and Economic Behavior, where they kind of introduced modern game theory. And this distinction between three different types of uh, free informational environments appeared in there. Okay, in the context of games, what corresponds to these situations? Well, common knowledge of the structure of the game being played, the players and the orders in which they move, and previous moves and everything else, that's, that's a perfect information game. Okay, so a leading example is chess. They also talked about the situation of <coughs> complete but imperfect information. So a situation that, where there's common knowledge of what the structure of the game is, what the rules are, etc. But people may be uncertain about the actions of people, even people who are moving at the same time as them, or past actions, uh, or there may be some exogenous uncertainty that they're not aware of. Okay, so this is complete but imperfect information in the context of a game. Okay, so a leading example would be poker. Von Neumann and Morgenstern um, talked about chess and they talked about poker. Those were their leading examples. Okay, but in the context of a game, uh, when incomplete information was, you know, what people meant about it when they were first discussing it was a situation, as we said, in the game theoretic context, there's not common knowledge of the structure of the game being played. Okay, so um, what would be a leading example of that? Well, ar arguably, um, all economic problems of interest, you're really not in practice going to have common knowledge of exactly what all the structure is. 
Um, so you might think that this would be a problem with the application of game theory. And indeed, many people thought that it was a problem with the application of game theory. Okay, so von Neumann and Morgenstern uh, were sort of clear about the point, which is that we cannot avoid the assumption that all subjects are consideration are completely informed about the physical characteristics of the situation in which they operate. Okay, so, so for them, and indeed for people uh, following soon after them, um, you know, the idea was that the theory was limited. The theory was limited in scope because it applied to these particular situations. Maybe there was imperfect information, but, you know, there was some common knowledge of the structure of the game. Okay? Uh, I was discussing this with Bob last week, and he pointed out this uh, quotation, um, uh, the things that he had had to say about the subject. So he wrote that the common knowledge assumption underlies all of game theory and much of economic theory, whatever be the model under discussion, the model itself must be assumed common knowledge. Uh, otherwise, the model is insufficiently specified and the analysis incoherent. Okay, so this is a concern that, uh, you know, you really have to be making some common knowledge assumptions. There's no way of getting around it. Okay? All right. But there was an argument that was made by John Hassani uh, in, uh, during the course of the 1960s, I think, but but published um, in 1967 and 68, which came to the remarkable conclusion that uh, incomplete information uh, was not a problem after all. That's the suggestion. Incomplete information is not a problem after all. Uh, why is that? Well, he sort of proposed, made a suggestion that in fact we can incorporate any incomplete information that we want uh, without loss of generality. Seemingly intractable problem this idea that, you know, we were stuck with having to make a lot of common knowledge assumptions, uh, you know, we can sort of get around it, uh, Hassan, you suggested. Okay, I'm going to have a tiny bit more math than, uh, uh, or at least a tiny amount more formulas, not analysis, than Eric, but, you know, it's going to be under control, I hope. Okay, so one idea that um, uh, John Hassan introduced uh, is he um, uh, introduced this idea of types which whose influence cannot be underestimated in modern economics and game theory. Um, so what was the idea? The idea was that suppose it was the case that there's a set of states that we care about, theta, let's say. Suppose it's the case that there are two players. Uh, there could be any number of players, but let's talk about two players, Ann and Bob. Uh, and we can think about a situation where each player, each person, Ann and Bob, um, has a set of possible types. TA for Anne, TB for Bob. Okay? So to, to, to make a type space, type spaces as we, as we use them today and as uh, suggested by, by Hassan Yi, um, what do we do? We say, okay, there's going to be some probability that Anne assigns, any particular type of Anne assigns, TA, assigns to any particular type of Bob, TB, uh, and uh, the state theta that we mentioned. Okay, so, so continuing to build on, on Larry's uh, comments, we end up with a function uh, that takes the set of types of Anne into a probability distribution over the types of Bob and the states of the world. Now, um, it's kind of important to uh, uh, reflect why this is um, a slightly different way of looking at the world, uh, you know, why this is a, a novel <laughs> way of looking at the world, Okay, people knew before Hassani that, um, you know, you can incorporate, like we said, imperfect information. We could say, you know, I don't know in poker um, uh, what the hand of the other player is. Okay, so we, we had ways in von Neumann and Morgenstern and before of modeling the idea that there are things that people don't know, like not knowing the type of the other player. The important idea in type spaces is that you could... Um, encode the, uh, you can encode an arbitrarily, you know, you could encode a lot of stuff in these abstract types. Okay, so types don't necessarily have a physical counterpart in the world. It's just a language that we use in order to encode uh, all kinds of stuff that people might be uncertain, to, uncertain about um, beliefs, higher order beliefs, uh, that kind of thing. You can really embed a lot in it. Okay, um, 
And um, so here I said with the dichotomy between game theory or economic theory on the one hand and mechanism design was going to be important to me. Okay, so in the context of game theory, um, it's important that this state space can be quite rich. We can embed a whole lot of stuff conceptually in this um, state space theta about which there's uncertainty. In the context of games, it can incorporate the rules of the game and the payoffs, this stuff that von Neumann and Morgenstern were worried about uh, in their discussion of complete information. Okay, in mechanism design, uh, what's important is that it can encompass um, players' preferences about outcomes in mechanism design. We don't start with the game, as that quote said, but we do have, uh, we do need to talk about what are players' preferences over actions, what are their beliefs about other players' preferences, and so on. Okay, so we can embed that. Okay, so another more advanced idea that is um, hinted at in Hassani, let's put it that way, uh, that is suggested by Hassani uh, is the idea of a universal type space. Okay? So this would be the suggestion that um, actually this type space language that we described is even um, better than we just suggested. That is to say, it seemed like you can embed quite a lot in type spaces. Um, uh, the, universal, the universal type space idea um, uh, says the following. It says that, uh, look, we can actually embed anything in the description of a type that we want to, that's relevant. Okay, so we would say, um, uh, and for example, would be characterized by, I can think of everything that could conceivably be relevant. So uh, we might care about her belief about the state. We might care about her belief about the state and Bob's belief about the state. We might care about her belief about the state and Bob's joint belief about the state and Anne's belief about the state and so on, okay? So that's, uh, you can't really want to say anything more about the situation than that list, you might not think. That's a complete description of anything that we might be worried about. Because we said you can encode in the state all kinds of stuff, okay? So we might say that Anne is characterized by this infinite sequence of such higher order beliefs or what are sometimes, uh, what would sometimes be called, uh, now be called universal types, okay? And we have the idea that there's a type space, uh, a universal type space, T star, which I can think of as consisting of all these hierarchies, all these beliefs and higher order beliefs that the players might have. And uh, this set is going to encode, that is the set of all these sequences of beliefs and higher order beliefs of Anne, is actually going to have encoded within it a belief about all of Bob's higher order beliefs, because you know they keep appearing there, and what the states of the world are. And in that sense, the set of uni you know this set of all types T star is equivalent to the set of probability distributions over the set of all types that Bob might be, and the payoff relevant states of the world. Okay, so that's the idea of the universal type space. Okay, and we can assume that this structure, this description, uh, um, the nature of this universal type space is common knowledge among the players. That is to say, if we fix a particular type space, like we did here, if we fix an arbitrary type space, we are assuming um, that the structure of this type space, we're implicitly assuming that the structure of this type space is common knowledge among the players, okay? Each player, uh, uh, Anne, is obviously convinced that Bob must be one of these types, and that's imposed some structure, uh, so that we're implicitly assuming that they understand the structure of this type space, okay? When we write down this type space, this universal type space, um, we, uh, um, there's no content in assuming that a player is one of these types, okay? There's nothing that we're imposing. We're just, imp we're just describing a language in which we describe anything that we would want to say, but there's no content in saying that, uh, um, that Anne has a type. This is just saying, I can embed anything that you want to do in these beliefs and, uh, and higher order beliefs in the universal type space, okay? So I could assume that this structure is common knowledge, okay? 
Now, I said that this was John Hassani part two. Uh, that's not quite true. It's not, he didn't exactly do that. Okay, so this slide says filling in the details. That's a, that's a joke, just in case you don't get it. Um, so uh, Hassani kind of suggested this point, but didn't um, completely uh, uh, you know, get to the end of that story. Okay, and you know, over the next uh, 25 years or so, um, I, I'm suggesting those uh, statements have been um, sort of formalized more precisely. Okay, so uh, I, I kept saying the words common knowledge. To make this precise, we'd, we'd probably better define what, what common knowledge is. So, so Bob Auman uh, did that, gave a formal notion of common knowledge. Um, incidentally, he, he reminded me uh, that the paper notes that this arose out of discussions with um, Arrow and Hahn. You can't really get away from Arrow. All right, in a good way, in a very good way. All right, so we needed a notion of common knowledge, okay? Um, we needed to formalize the idea, you know, this idea of a universal type space, okay? I, I uh, rather, uh, um, was rather cavalier in uh, describing this connection between the set of universal types and the set of beliefs of uh, other players' universal types and, and states of the world. There's some mathematical <coughs> and conceptual uh, detail to be filled in there. Okay, so this construction of the universal type space was, was eventually done. Okay, uh, uh, that's a certain way of saying that it's without loss of generality in a sort of semantic sense, building in a bunch of to topological um, uh, and properties of beliefs, countability of the type space and stuff like that. And Alman also um, gave a uh, syntactic formalization, which you might think of as a more basic and primitive formulation of the idea that is without common knowledge, to, it is without loss of generality to assume common knowledge uh, of the structure of the environment. Okay? So, um, so let me say, by the way, that I'm very happy to take questions or comments, especially from Bob. But, you know, <laughs> um, all right. All right, but I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to claim that uh, uh, an important point I want to make is that um, this contribution um, of John Hassani, this way of modeling incomplete information, and I'm and and the um, formalization of that that um, took place in the next 25 years. Uh, I want to uh, argue that there's a sense in which there is a misunderstanding. Um, among the profession, kind of an important one, um, that, that really people think about this the wrong way. Okay? They think about what the contribution of John Hassani is the wrong way, and it's kind of important for mechanism design that people think about it the wrong way. Okay? So the good news is that by working with a universal type space, we can dispense with common knowledge assumptions. That's unbelievably good news. Okay? It means relative to this, relative to what? Von Neumann and Morgenstern suggested that the theory was kind of useless unless you, know, you knew from somewhere, from outside the model, um, that there was common knowledge of such and such. Um, uh, yeah, we thought that it was useful, so it, we thought that it was hopeless, and this argument is saying that um, we can dispense with all such common knowledge assumptions if we really want to. Okay, so there's no limit on our tool in being able to describe uh, incomplete information that's out there. Okay? In fact, this distinction, the words are used in a confused way these days, actually. This distinction between imperfect information and incomplete information, in a certain sense, disappeared, okay? in the sense that we can always assume that there's common knowledge of the environment. So in the language that I had at the beginning, uh, the distinction kind of disappears. Okay? Good news. Bad news, uh, in the economics profession, uh, you know, in game theory and mechanism design, what did we do? We went back to simply making the same assumptions that we were making before uh, about, you know, the same strong common knowledge assumptions about in the models that we wrote down, okay? So, and I think that the uh, sociology of this is that assumptions that looked a little suspicious, assuming that we understood the whole game, et cetera, et cetera, 
acquired a certain, uh, a certain respectability because of uh, Hassani and, and the work following up on Hassani. The fact that, so you know, the, the logical flaw, as it were, is the fact that um, it was, uh, you know, the fact whether it's possible or not to come up with a, richer a rich enough language to describe anything you want, to relax any common knowledge assumptions that you want, uh, doesn't give some added justification for writing down a model in which you're making strong common knowledge assumptions. The fact that it's logically possible to relax those assumptions <laughs> doesn't make it legitimate to think that we can always assume that people have, uh, uh, that it's common knowledge that players have values drawn from independent distributions or the type of assumptions that we use in practice. Okay? So, so, um, so that's the misunderstanding. Okay? So what I want to do uh, in this lecture is um, talk a little bit about uh, what I think might be implications of what I'm calling a misunderstanding for uh, mechanism design. All right. So, um, uh, so let's talk more specifically. The claim was that this misunderstanding is, is big. It's, you know, people... Uh, uh, went down that path, and people are a little confused about it. Um, and that's true in general, but I'm, I'm interested in this talk in mechanism design, the subject of this year's summer school. Okay? Uh, Eric uh, sometimes refers to the Wilson Doctrine, which is that uh, Bob Wilson has been very emphatic that uh, we make too strong assumptions when we're doing mechanism design. So here's a quotation that I like. It gets to exactly the point that I want to get at. He says, game theory has the great advantage in explicitly analyzing the consequences of trading rules, let's say mechanisms, uh, that presumably are really common knowledge. It is deficient to the extent it assumes other features to be common knowledge. I foresee the progress of, uh, of game theory as depending on successive reductions in the base of common knowledge. That's what we need. We need to keep weakening the common knowledge assumptions in order to do useful stuff. Okay, that was the statement of, of, uh, of Wilson. Okay? Uh, I want to interpret what, um, uh, or argue, somewhat based on, on what Bob Wilson says, that there's actually an important difference between mechanism and game theory in this context. Okay, in mechanism design, you might think that we really want to assume that there's complete information about the game or the me mechanism being played. There's common knowledge about what the mechanism is. In fact, it may be one of the few places where it actually is a reasonable assumption. How do you know it's common knowledge? Well, because you chose it and you explained to people what the rules were. So if you wanted a test case in which common knowledge would be a reasonable assumption, this might be it. I mean, you could quibble, but you've designed the game, you know. So that's good. Uh, but you might also think that it is particularly desirable in mechanism design relative to elsewhere uh, to relax the common knowledge assumptions, not about the game or the mechanism, but about the environment in which we live. That is about the, um, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the preferences that players in the economy have about different act outcomes, what do they believe about other people's preferences and so on, okay? Not the game but the underlying economy, the underlying environment, um, we, got, we should worry about uh, uh, assuming too much common knowledge there that's not going to be reasonable, uh, sensible to assume. Okay, and there's a very special reason why it's important to worry about it that is particular to mechanism design, so to worry about it more in the context of mechanism design. The particular reason is that uh, if I'm designing a mechanism and I think that I have the right, uh, uh, you know, some uh, highly structured understanding of what the beliefs are and how, uh, of what the type space is. So basically, I've built in a whole lot of strong common knowledge assumptions. What's your optimal mechanism going to do? That is, when I do the analysis on a type space in which I've built up too much, uh, too much, a lot of common knowledge. Okay, what's going to happen is well your optimal mechanism is going to be too finely tuned to the set of, to, to the common knowledge assumption that you've assumed, okay? 
we're contrasting this with game theory. Okay? In game theory, in economic theory more broadly, um, you might think that it's really important to relax the common knowledge assumption of the game or the mechanism. That's really the, the, critical, uh, uh, the critical issue. Okay? John Sutton at uh, LSE um, has long been making uh, this argument that it's a, it's a massive flaw of industrial organization that we're trying to model something, how do firms compete in a market in oligopoly, but you try and write it down as a game and you say, well, I could model it as people choosing uh, quantities, or no competition, I could model it as firms choosing prices. These are games that are supposed <coughs> to capture some form of reality, and what do we know? We know that the outcomes are very sensitive to the um, game that you use to represent the situation, and we don't know what the true game is. It's more complicated than what we're capturing with our game theoretic ideas. Okay, so this is the other way around. This is saying that the bottleneck, the really important issue, is the common knowledge assumptions about the game. Okay, the common knowledge assumption about the environment, ah, that could be a problem too. We should investigate that a little bit. But it's not uh, such a big deal as in mechanism design. Okay? That's the idea. Okay? Now, if we agree that, um, you know, it's a problem, that actually the problem, the difficulty with doing analysis with incomplete information that uh, uh, von Neumann, von Neumann and uh, Morgenstern hinted at in the late 40s, if we think that actually constructing this you know, this conceptual contribution of Harsanyi really hasn't get ar got around that problem very much, then maybe we're back to a world where we can't really uh, model incomplete information. We shouldn't kid ourselves that we can model real incomplete information. So what should we do? Well, maybe we should do something else entirely. Okay, we really, um, you know, this set of assumptions, the, the full rationality, the, um, uh, the assumption that it's okay to assume that there's common knowledge of some simple structure of the environment. If that's not okay, then maybe we should just go off and do something different, okay? So maybe we should just directly assume simple mechanisms, optimal, you know, the idea that we've captured everything in our model doesn't make sense, so let's just focus on reasonab reasonable simple mechanisms. Let's look at other constraints, look at computational constraints. We might look at worst case um, analysis in instead of trying to embed all this uh, beliefs and lack of common knowledge that players have. Um, and I think that these are very, uh, uh, very fine ways to go. So Tim kind of talked a little bit like that uh, this morning and we're going to hear, hear more about tomorrow. So, so you know, we can just um, accept that the um, rationality and common knowledge assumptions that we're making just may not be a very good uh, way to go and just go a different way. Okay? Um, I'm going to um, uh, discuss a different response, uh, which is um, uh, suggesting that um, maybe what we should do is uh, take the idea of relaxing common knowledge assumptions um, uh, seriously. Okay, we have the language to do that. It's not like we don't know how to do it. Okay, it's simple enough to do conceptually. That's, that's the Hassani uh, contribution. Um, so, uh, so then that suggests an agenda which we should take seriously, relaxing the common knowledge assumptions and seeing what happens. All right. I'm going to, well, let me do one more thing, which is, uh, uh, all right, let me make uh, one um, uh, more point about the universal type space. There is one type of restriction, which is a common knowledge restriction, which, um, uh, which we often make, which is we make the assumption that instead of it being the case that we're thinking about incomplete information about some state of the world that embeds um, uh, a whole lot of information about the world that we care about, we can instead restrict attention to a simpler world where we say, well, let's assume that for each player, for Anne and Bob, Let's assume that there exist some parameters, let's call them theta A and theta B, that um, summarize the preferences of our players. 
Okay, so there's some parameter theta a, which I could think of, which which is going to be a complete description of what Anne's preferences are. Okay, uh, uh, we sometimes call this the private values assumption. It's that players know everything that they need to evaluate outcomes. Okay, if you do that, if you want to build that into your model of the world, uh, we actually, in order to do that. See, this is a common knowledge assumption, but it seems like a reasonable, you know, there's certainly context in which you would want to make this common knowledge assumption, okay? If you want to do that, I want to note, uh, we do need a slightly different uh, type space and universal type space, okay? The natural language for talking about things now is to say, well, again, we'll say that Anne has a set of types, but the natural way to model this is to say Anne has a set of types but, Anne, but we're going to be able to pin down for Anne what her payoff, this payoff parameter theta a is. Okay? This is different. I just want to highlight that it's different. Okay? So the, the, the right type space would be one where we say um, for each type of Anne, there is some payoff type that she knows associated with that, and there is some belief about the types of others. Okay? We don't have to talk about explicitly about her beliefs about the types of Bob, because Bob's types have encoded within them a description of what Bob's payoff parameter are. Okay? So this is a more special kind of type space. We, yep? Can you explain what exactly you give up in the general uh, Well, you give up the possibility that um, there's some common component of preferences, so I, uh, so to describe Anne's preferences over some particular outcomes in the world, I can do that independently of what's Bob's, of, you know, anything about what Bob's preferences are. Let me put it this way. If I was going to give, uh, ask Anne to choose between lotteries over <coughs> outcomes, I know that if um, we were in such a private value world, um, she would not care about anything that Bob does because, you know, her type would be a sufficient condition for what her preferences are. Okay. Uh, yep. Right, right. So all that stuff is built in. There is going to be an analogous universal type space um, uh, where we're going to say, what is Anne's universal type space in this case? It's going to say, well, what matters is her payoff parameter. Uh, which she knows, so that's going to be a description of her type. But she's also going to have a belief about Bob's payoff parameter. She's going to have a belief about both Bob's belief about her type and the payoff parameter and so on. Okay, so it's a slightly different construction, and we get a slightly different universal type space. Okay, the set of universal type spaces for Anne are going to be a description of her payoff type and a description of her beliefs about the payoff types of others. Uh, and I could think of this as a subset of the universal type space that I described before. Okay, a strict subset. Okay, we can, we can, um, okay. All right. So, so this is one common knowledge assumption. Let's talk about some other common knowledge assumptions that, you know, you might be imposing implicitly or explicitly. Uh, here are some type space assumptions that are typically uh, made um, and um, and that constitute, let's call them implicit common knowledge assumptions, because what we're doing is we're looking at particular, we're working with particular t uh, uh, forms of type space. It's not the universal type space, so my language is going to be any time you don't work with the universal type space, you're making some implicit common knowledge assumptions in your structure. Okay, so here are some assumptions that you might make. You might restrict attention to analyzing what we might call a naive type space, a naive type space where you assume that for each payoff parameter, the payoff parameters that we just described, um, there is a single uh, belief. Okay, or to put it differently, we identify types with payoff parameters. Okay, now of course this is the standard thing that we do, okay, but it is a restriction. The assumption that for every payoff parameter in, in the context of auction design or something, it would be for every private value, um, we have a, uh, um, we identify a unique belief for that payoff parameter. Okay, we sometimes assume the common prior, the property that if I look at your beliefs over other players' types, 
they could have been derived from some true probability distribution that you're updating. Okay? It's common to assume uh, either, when we're working with such a naive type space, to assume either independence, which is what? It's an assumption that your beliefs um, are the same, independent of your payoff type, or it's common to assume um, what Neiman has called uh, beliefs determine preferences type spaces or beliefs determine payoff parameters where you assume that uh, once I know your beliefs it pins down what your payoff parameter is okay this is something that happens if I did assume uh, if we assumed a naive type space and we picked uh, what would sometimes what is sometimes called a generic probability distribution on that type space so we uh, randomly choose all the numbers in the probability distribution, then we will automatically get the belief determined preferences property. Okay, so those are sometimes assumptions that are assumed. Sometimes you will hear people make, sen make uh, statements that if you think about what they mean, what they're doing is they're um, implicitly assuming that what you want to do is you want to come up with a mechanism, you're doing mechanism design on the assumption that maybe we don't know what the naive type space is, okay? So we don't know what the common prior is, let's say. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to implement on the uh, union of some class of type spaces. So you might be trying to implement on the union of all naive, common prior, independent type spaces. What does that mean? That means that uh, I don't know what the true naive common prior type space is. I want the mechanism to work across all of them. Okay, what I want to highlight is that that's a very different thing from saying that you can implement on the universal type space, which is equivalent to saying that you can implement on any type space, okay, but it's not restricting attention to type spaces that have this special property, uh, you know, these special properties of having the common prior assumption or being independent or something like that. Okay, so this is where we build in common knowledge restrictions, okay? All right, so what I want to do um, in my talk is just make a few, oh, okay, sorry, let me say something else. So uh, there's a bunch of things that one can do within this agenda of saying, let's take some standard results that are out there in the literature and let's uh, relax the common knowledge assumptions, you know, in the way suggested by uh, this slide here that you can say, well, suppose I do the same type of thing uh, of saying, you know, how do we maximize revenue or how do we implement a social choice function? But when I reduce the assumptions of this form that you're making and I relax it in this direction, okay, you can do it one step at a time, but if you start relaxing assumptions in this direction. So there's a bunch of things that we can do and we talked about uh, and some of them came up during the course of the summer school. I'm not going to try and, uh, I won't try and talk about them here. I just want to do something, uh, uh, you know, less ambitious. I just want to make a couple of points um, uh, about, uh, well, two types of points. The first point is to just uh, flag the fact that when we get wacky conclusions, when we do mechanism design, it probably has to do with the fact that we're making implicit common knowledge assumptions that are nutty, okay? So that was one of the claims that I made at the beginning, is that it's particularly dangerous in mechanism design to, uh, you know, to make more common knowledge assumptions than you really should. It's particularly nutty because then you're going to get nutty conclusions where, where things are too finely tuned to those implicit common knowledge assumptions. Okay, so let me just talk about some uh, well-known, to people who know this literature, but well-known to people who know this literature, wacky results, and just highlight um, uh, what they have to do with making too strong common knowledge assumptions. Okay, so um, a famous problem in mechanism design, I suppose it's the case that you're deciding uh, how to allocate a single good to a bunch of people who, like in that thing that I just showed you, uh, have private value, so they know what the object is worth to them. Very classical problem, very well-known that uh, it's easy to implement the efficient outcome. You can ask them to engage in a second price auction and it will then be allocated to the person who values it the most. But there are two very <coughs> contrasting results about revenue. 
Okay, there's a result that if you say you have what I'm going to call just to um, uh, push these points home, I'm going to call an independent, naive, common prior type space, okay, which would be the standard thing that we assume. Um, it is well known that in this case, buyers earn information rent, that is to say, uh, even though the allocation is efficient, uh, the, the, um, the buyers are able to get some um, surplus from the transaction because they know something that the seller doesn't know. Okay, and then we have this other result, which in this language I'm going to say is that with a belief determined preferences, naive common prior type space, we still get the efficient outcome, but we get full surplus extraction, meaning that the seller of the good uh, is able to um, get the entire value of the good from the people who are buying the good. Okay? And in this environment, um, there's a um, paradoxical, uh, I mean, arguably paradoxical result that you could offer to the players um, the possibility of making a bet where they say, uh, what's their beliefs about the valuations of other players, given that we have belief determined preferences that once I know their belief I know what their preferences are okay I could offer them a bet uh, this bet could give them an incentive of indeed a strict incentive to truthfully report what their beliefs are and with belief determined preferences what their preferences are okay but it has no expected cost to the seller uh, because in expected terms um, uh, the expectation of this bet is going to be zero okay so that's a um, uh, apparent paradox, okay? It comes about because we're assuming that there's common knowledge of, th that is that we are living in a world that just consists of these um, naive common prior type spaces and we get these, you know, this possibility with belief determined preferences type spaces which seems a little wacky, okay? But that's because we've built certain assumptions uh, we've made these two strong common knowledge assumptions which give us this funny conclusion. Okay? The results that we get here also depend on the particular common knowledge, common prior assumptions. So, um, okay. so that's an example of a funny result which you should understand as being a consequence of making two, two strong common knowledge assumptions. Okay? There are then some questions about what you do about that. Uh, I will... Um, I will skip that, um, uh, but I guess the general point is you should just think about richer type spaces, okay, without getting into details. That's the right response to that problem. Here's another example, uh, which I'll call prior extraction. Okay, think about the problem. So these are the most, uh, I guess, two of the most basic uh, problems in mechanism design. Um, uh, certainly in Eric's lectures at the beginning of the summer school. So second most basic problem, you might think, is a situation where um, you're deciding, um, we're looking at a public goods problem, so we're deciding which public good um, project to implement, what, b what bridge to build or whatever. Uh, consider such a problem where the valuations that people have about the public goods um, are private, okay? This, there's this payoff parameter theta a that tells you how much Anne values this good and we can make transfers we can make you know we can ask people to pay for the good um, uh, we have to make it incentive compatible for players to, to reveal what's their valuation of the good but we have the added restriction that we have to have budget balance okay we can't we can't charge people money for it uh, or we can't pay them money for it without getting the money from somewhere else okay so two um, uh, classic results in this area are that it is not possible to implement the efficient action, the efficient outcome in dominant strategies. Okay, so it is not possible to come up with a rule for allocating the good as a function of people's private values if you have to ask them to report their private values and you want it to be the case that they have um, uh, an incentive to reveal their private value independent of what they think other people are doing. Okay. Then there's a possibility result which says that it is possible to implement the efficient choice in Bayes-Nash equilibria. Okay, so if we make the weaker requirement that, that it's not the case that you have an incentive to 
uh, truthfully report your value, uh, whatever you think other people are going to do, but it's merely that you have an incentive to truthfully report your value if you think everybody is behaving according to some equilibrium strategy. Okay, so this is a classical um, uh, issue, the contrast between these two results. Okay, well, um, oh yeah, Arrow again. So uh, key contributors to that area as well. All right, but here's a question. So, so you know, this question is asked in the standard paradigm of naive, common prior, independent type spaces, okay? Uh, and a natural question to ask is, well, what if it's the case that the prior is not known, okay? Now, in the language that um, I tried to talk about, to say that we're trying to implement when the prior is not known, that's saying that we want to implement on the union of common prior, independent, naive type spaces, okay? That's a certain uh, set of situations where you want your mechanism to work, okay? It's not the universal type space. The fact that you don't know the prior on a naive type space isn't the same thing as saying that you don't have common knowledge about the environment. There's all sorts of stuff built in to this idea that, you know, we know that the type space has a certain structure, common prior, independent, naive, but we don't know what the prior is, okay? So there, is, there are a couple of um, uh, classic uh, responses to this situation, okay? Uh, one response is to say, well, since you don't know the prior, um, we should assume dominant strategies because I don't have the possibility of making my, um, uh, making my behavior depend on what the prior is, the beliefs of the other players, and we're back to the negative results here. That is, we might say, since the prior is not known, what we've got to do is look at dominant strategies. Okay, so we're back to the negative result. There's also, this was my second funny result, there's also um, uh, an argument, a folk argument. I actually found a reference for it eventually, but people always, uh, this is a sort of uh, folk argument that you sometimes hear people give which is, look, that in this situation, you can implement the efficient choice, okay? How could you implement the efficient choice? What you could do is, is you could ask players to report what the prior is on this naive, independent uh, uh, type space. You could ask them to report what it is, and if they report something different, then you punish them, okay? That's a mechanism in which you could do things in two stages. You could first ask them to report their priors. I said shoot them. You could, you could uh, uh, take away a, uh, a lot of money from them outside the model, okay? Um, uh, and then you could do this mechanism, this famous mechanism that Arrow and others suggested. Once you know what the prior is, um, you can uh, implement the efficient allocation as, as Eric explained to us last week, okay? It's the same point, okay? That this idea that you can do that is because you've made too strong um, implicit common knowledge assumptions that instead of being on the universal type space of beliefs and higher order beliefs about what people's valuations of public goods are, we're assuming instead that there is common knowledge that we are on such a type space, naive, independent, blah, 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 but the only uncertainty about what the prior is, that gives you the wacky result that is obviously wrong at some level. It doesn't really make sense to do that. Yeah? The idea is no one would agree to play along with this. You'll shoot us all if you don't mean the same thing, meaning that anyone who means a little uncertain about the thing. Yeah, that, that would be, uh, that's a way of saying it, that we want to be on a richer type space. The, 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 the funny assumption here is that yeah, it's more than that, actually. The assumption is that it's common knowledge among the players that they're living on a naive, uh, well, it could be, let's say independent is the usual case. They're living in a, um, one of these type spaces where um, uh, 
you know, everybody has the same beliefs about the others. It's derived from a common prior. You, um, uh, yeah, so there is some true belief that everybody has about the other players, but it's common knowledge among the players, as you say, and there isn't some additional um, beliefs for each valuation on the type space. So, it, yeah, the assumption is that the players know the prior and the mechanism designer doesn't, a little bit more than that because you're also saying that that common prior is on some very simple uh, view of what the beliefs and higher order beliefs might be. Yep. I think we could weaken this a little bit. I mean, I could have a, I could have a prior, you could have a prior, as long as there was common knowledge about the prior, about our collective priors, we could still do it. Yeah, I thought that was what I was saying. The union of... Oh, the u I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. What, what I mean by the union is exactly that there's common knowledge among us. Right. Yeah. Right. Right, yeah, sorry. The common prior is a complete red herring for this issue. Yeah. All right, so incidentally, um, so, you know, you might say what the right thing to do, I mean, I am saying it repeatedly, that the right thing to do might be to think about what happens on the universal type space, uh, you know, open questions for people who've been at the summer school, we don't know what happens if you say let's in equilibrium in a classical public good problem ask what would happen if I looked at Bayesian Nash equilibrium on the universal type space. We don't know. It's not, I could tell you afterwards why it's not an easy problem. Um, you know, you sometimes can implement, you sometimes can't implement. It's not implied by these two problems, by, by these two questions. It's a more complicated question. Okay? <coughs> All right. So last thing I'm going to say, I'll try and finish a few minutes early, um, since we're a few minutes behind schedule. All right. So uh, let me make one last uh, uh, point, which is that I did emphasize the fact that the... Um, uh, that the private values assumption was with loss of generality. Okay? It, it's a common knowledge assumption. You might want to make it. I, I'm good with making assumptions if you're common knowledge assumptions if you're sure you want to make them. You just shouldn't make them by by accident without quite realizing what you're doing. Okay, so that was an assumption. Okay? We surely might want to relax the assumption under some circumstances. Okay? Uh, so we might want to assume that values are interdependent, okay? So uh, it's not the case that I can predict my value without reference to Bob and his value and his beliefs and higher order beliefs. They're somehow entangled, okay? So we could relax that assumption, okay? Here's an example uh, that I used during my uh, uh, lecture yesterday, okay? Suppose it was the case that we keep the same formulation that we say there's a payoff parameter for Anne and there's a payoff parameter for Bob, theta A and theta B, we would be working with the same universal, the, the same known payoff parameter universal type space that I described. But now let's assume that the valuations of the object aren't given by this parameter itself, theta A, but it depends on the other person's payoff parameter. Okay, so the value of Anne is her payoff parameter theta a plus some weight gamma times the payoff parameter of the other person, gamma some number uh, between zero and one, let's say. Okay, this is a model that, that, uh, that I've worked <laughs> with, okay? All right, <coughs> analogously for Bob, okay? And I knew that was gonna be interesting. There's two interpretations, <laughs> it's not three interpretations, all right. So one assumption could be um, that Eric mentioned, and his Eric gave an overview of all the literature, which is why I keep referencing his lectures. So um, one justification might be that theta A is Anne's actual consumption value, but um, there's a possibility that Anne will, uh, let's say, be forced to resell the good to Bob in the future, and when he sells it, he'll get some... Um, uh, He'll be able to get some percentage of the consumption value of Bob, let's say gamma. Uh, that would be a story that could lie behind uh, that payoff function that I wrote down. Okay. Another assumption might be that there's some common value component, some private value, you know, 
some private value component. You can't quite tell them apart. I'm going to interpret these theta A's and theta B's as signals that Anne and Bob have observed about what the true value is. You know, you could give different interpretations. Okay? Well, I'm into uh, implicit common knowledge assumptions. So let's highlight some implicit common knowledge assumptions that are represented by this model. That is the assumption. We've now gone beyond private values, which we said had some implicit common knowledge assumptions. Now we've said, let's look at a very, very simple interdependent values example, work with the same universal type space, uh, and let's talk a little bit about implicit common knowledge assumptions. Okay, so suppose this was the case. Okay, suppose it was the case that this was um, the relationship between the values of Ann and Bob and some characteristic, some payoff parameter that were available to Ann and Bob. Okay, we can do some linear algebra. Okay, these are two linear equations in two uh, unknowns. Okay, so one thing that we could do, two unknowns, theta A and theta B. We can do our linear algebra and we can say, okay, I can express the payoff parameter of Anne and the payoff parameter of Bob as a function of the values um, of Anne and Bob. Okay, just inverting that equation. But if you think about it, what we're then assuming in this model, if I do the payoff parameter universal type space about theta A and theta B, what we're implicitly assuming is that we're implicitly assuming that there's common knowledge among the players that Anne knows VA minus gamma B and Bob knows VB minus gamma A. Okay? Is that point clear? So if I put it that way, I think it's a good thing to make explicit, implicit assumptions that are being made. Now, is that a good assumption to make? Well, it kind of depends. If I, if I'm, if I'm really take this story seriously, that you know, there's this resale process, and um, uh, and that really is this consumption value that Anne knows and Bob doesn't know, then that's fine. This is the assumption that you're making. Okay, if you're using it as a shorthand to capture some type of inter interdependence of values that there might be, and you're not exactly sure what the interpretation is, then you've built in this very strong assumption. Okay? Uh, it is possible, and I'm going to skip this, um, it is possible to respond to that um, uh, surprising observation that observation that we're making implicit common knowledge assumptions when we model interdependence that way, one thing that one can do is one can write down a somehow the right language in which to talk about inter interdependent values without making common knowledge assumptions. Okay, what is the right language? The right language is analogous to the universal belief space that I can talk about a universal preference space instead. I can say what is the unconditional expected value of Anne about the good. What would she, how would she value the object, her expected valuation of the object, if she didn't know how Bob, uh, if she didn't know anything about Bob? Okay, and we can ask the question, how much would she value the object uh, conditional on knowing that Bob's unconditional valuation was such and such? Okay? You can do that. You can construct a universal uh, interdependent preference space and you can find out, and this is a language where you can talk about every, including interdependence, every statement um, that is, um, you know, anything that could happen in terms of preferences and interdependent preferences. So it has the same generality of the universal state space for beliefs, but it also <coughs> builds into the description payoff parameters, not burying things in this function like VA plus gamma VB, I mean, theta A plus ga gamma theta B. Okay, so uh, we had a wonderful hour session, and we have to go eat. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish. Uh, uh, I thought I would finish a little bit early. Uh, so I hope. Okay, so to summarize, I think I did aim to do two things in this talk. Okay, part one was to convince you that there's an issue here. Okay, that we have people outside the discipline. Sorry, I keep uh, pointing at Tim. So. <laughs> people outside the discipline who are interested in mechanism design, it just seems bizarre um, 
uh, some of the assumptions that get made because they're obviously so uh, so unrealistic, and you kind of think um, um, that they're slightly crazy assumptions to make. Um, the uh, you know my my uh, my thesis is a, a sort of sociological or history of thought thesis is that um, there's really this uh, this misunderstanding that the fact that you can write down type space that incorporate um, anything that you want and in that sense you don't need to make common knowledge assumptions that doesn't mean that if you write down a type space you're not making common knowledge assumptions and people sometimes get confused about that and if there's one uh, message from my talk uh, uh, I hope I've gotten that point across and the fact that this is um, however important it is elsewhere it's really, really important when you're doing mechanism design. That this, uh, um, this idea that you're building in common knowledge assumptions that you don't want to make is especially problematic when you're doing mechanism design because you're designing optimal mechanisms based on the common knowledge assumption and you overuse the uh, implicit common knowledge assumptions that you're making. Okay, so what should one do? Uh, I would make um, a couple of points. One is that it is an interesting research agenda in which some things have been done but much more could be done to think about classical questions and what happens when you relax those assumptions. That's one direction in which you can go. Um, where I was kind of going, talking about that interdependent values example, is that if you really try and relax all common knowledge assumptions, um, you really are going to get into an environment where it's really very hard to do anything. Okay, we had that structure in the interdependent values case, but then I was moaning that that has too much um, implicit common knowledge assumptions built into it, and I can mechanically go through, okay, how do I relax that common knowledge assumption? I started describing this universal space of interdependent preferences. Um, so, you know, as we suggested, Hassani, um, uh, suggested that one could relax assumptions, uh, common knowledge assumptions about beliefs. I hinted at the fact that you can go further and you can relax common knowledge assumptions about preferences and construct a universal higher order preference space, but actually um, there are going to be limits to what you can do there. Okay, so you're kind of, um, it's probably not the way to go to assume that you can really uh, relax all common knowledge assumptions because you're really not going to be able to say very much. Okay, so the, um, uh, I guess my suggestion about what one should do uh, in this um, direction is one should be explicit about what implicit common knowledge assumptions are being made and to understand how those implicit assumptions are affecting what the conclusions are. And you should um, consider carefully what would be appropriate um, things to assume that are common knowledge for a given problem. One way to judge that is whether you really think that this common knowledge assumption is something that you um, trust that people can condition on. Okay, if you don't like the um, full surplus extraction result, or you don't like the prior extraction results, uh, it's because you're making some common knowledge assumption that, um, that you really didn't intend to make, you just thought about the problem the wrong way. And I will stop that.